Hey guys, how's it going? Mr. Mitchell here. In this video, we're going to go over exactly what you need to know and be able to do for the dynamics topic in the National 5 Physics course. So let's get started. Now, being one of the biggest topics in the National 5 course, the SQA split the dynamics topic into six key areas. So we have vectors and scalars, acceleration, velocity time graphs, Newton's laws, projectile motion, and lastly, energy. So we'll go through each of these sections in turn so you can see what you need to know and be able to do for the exam. So vectors and scalars is our first section, and this says firstly that you need to define vector and scalar quantities. So remember, a scalar quantity is one that has a magnitude or size only, whereas a vector quantity has both magnitude and a direction. You need to be able to identify force, speed, velocity, distance, displacement, acceleration, mass, time, and energy as vector or scalar quantities. So you need to be able to sort them into either scalar or vector. So remember our scalars here, the ones that only have a magnitude, are speed, distance, mass, time, and energy. Whereas the vector quantities here are force, velocity, displacement, and acceleration. You also need to be able to calculate the resultant of two vector quantities in one dimension or at right angles. So remember the key rule when you want to add any two vectors together is that you need to add them nose to tail. So if you're dealing with vectors in one dimension, you add them nose to tail and these ones will be a bit simpler than adding the vectors at right angles. Because when we add vectors at right angles and join them nose to tail, we end up drawing the resultant vector which forms a right angle triangle. And that brings us on to the next point which is determine displacement and or distance using a scale diagram or the calculation method. And similarly determine velocity and or speed using a scale diagram or the calculation method. So remember for the scale diagram you want to ensure your diagram is as big as possible and you would use a ruler to measure the length of the resultant vector and a protractor to measure the angle and you can then find your direction from that angle. Or for the calculation method remember you want to add the vectors nose to tail to form a right angle triangle and then you can label the parts in the triangle and find the hypotenuse of the triangle using Pythagoras c squared equals a squared plus b squared and then you can find the angle using tan theta equals opposite over adjacent. But that is only going to give you the angle. Remember, you need to define the direction using compass points or bearings. You then need to use appropriate relationships to solve problems involving velocity, speed, displacement, distance, and time. So we have displacement equals velocity times time, S equals VT. Distance equals average speed times time, so D equals V bar T. And displacement equals average velocity times time, so S equals V bar T. Lastly, for section one, you need to be able to describe experiments to measure average and instantaneous speed. So remember to measure average speed of a moving trolley on a ramp. The trolley would have a card or mask and you would set up two light gates connected to a timer. You would let the card pass through both light gates and knowing the distance between the two light gates and finding the time taken for the card to cut through the first light gate to the second light gate, we can then calculate the average speed using the distance divided by the time. Whereas for instantaneous speed, the setup differs where we have one light gate instead of two and we measure the time taken from the front of the card to cut the light gate until the back of the card cuts the light gate. And once we measure the length or width of the card on the trolley rather than the distance between light gates, we can say that instantaneous speed is equal to the width of card divided by the time or V equals D over T. Moving on to section two, we have define acceleration in terms of initial velocity, final velocity, and time. Well, remember acceleration is defined as the change in velocity per unit time or the change in velocity of an object each second. And that change in velocity involves the final velocity minus the initial velocity. And that brings us to the equation. So it says use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving acceleration, initial velocity or speed, final velocity or speed, and time. So we have A equals V minus U over T, where A is acceleration, V is final velocity or speed, U is initial velocity or speed, and T is time. It then says determine acceleration from a velocity time graph. Well, you need to remember that on a velocity time graph, acceleration is equal to the gradient of the line on the velocity time graph. Or you can also find acceleration just using the acceleration equation. Lastly, for section two, you need to be able to describe an experiment to measure acceleration. Well, this is very similar to our experimental setup for measuring average speed, where we can have two light gates connected to a timer and a ramp, and we would have the trolley moving down the ramp where the trolley has something called a double mask on top. So that's two bits of card separated by some space. And what you would do is you would measure the width of each of the cards, you would input it to the timer, and you would then let the trolley move down the ramp, and the timer can be set up to give you an initial speed, final speed and a time so that you can plug it into the acceleration equation A equals V minus U over T. Section three is quite short and it starts by saying you need to be able to draw or sketch velocity time or speed time graphs from data. So if you're given a situation with some text and you're given speeds and times, it might ask you to draw or sketch a velocity time graph from that data. 
You also need to be able to interpret a velocity time graph to describe the motion of an object. Well, remember we have things like the constant velocity being represented by a straight horizontal line. We have uniform or constant acceleration being shown by a positively sloping diagonal line on the velocity time graph. We have a negatively sloping line on the velocity time graph representing a constant deceleration. And lastly, we have an object changing direction when we go from above the x-axis to below the x-axis on our graph or vice versa. Lastly, it says to determine displacement from a velocity time graph. And remember, you can find distance or displacement from a velocity time graph by finding the area under the graph. And for that, we use the areas of rectangles, length times breadth, and the area of triangles, half times base times height. Moving on to section four, Newton's laws. The first one says you need to be able to apply Newton's laws and balanced forces to explain constant velocity or speed, making reference to frictional forces. So this is really getting at Newton's first law of motion, which is all to do with balanced forces and constant speeds. So it helps to know what Newton's first law of motion is. It then says apply Newton's laws and unbalanced forces to explain and or determine acceleration for situations where more than one force is acting. So you need to be able to combine forces in one dimension or in more than one dimension. And remember, if forces act in the same direction, we just add them together. But if they act in opposite directions, we subtract the smaller one away from the bigger one. And this point is all to do with Newton's second law, because remember that is all to do with unbalanced forces acting on an object. Next, you need to be able to use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving unbalanced force, mass and acceleration for situations where one or more forces are acting in one dimension or at right angles. So we have F equals MA, the equation for Newton's second law, where F is our unbalanced force, M is mass and A is the acceleration. You then need to be able to use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving weight, mass and gravitational field strength. And remember these are linked with the equation W equals MG where W is the weight, M is the mass, and G is the gravitational field strength. Now remember you get values of G on the data sheet, but it helps to remember things like the G value on Earth, which is 9.8 newtons per kilogram, the G value on the Moon, which is 1.6 newtons per kilogram, and maybe those for Mars and Mercury as well, which are both 3.7 newtons per kilogram. It then says to explain the motion resulting from a reaction force in terms of Newton's third law. Now this is getting at the idea of Newton's third law and Newton pairs, where we have an action and a reaction force. So sometimes you might be given an action force and are asked to state what the reaction force is. And there are many different examples that exist. Lastly, you need to be able to explain free fall and terminal velocity in terms of Newton's laws. So remember, free fall is when an object experiences the influence of gravity alone, whereas we can think about terminal velocity in the situation of a skydiver jumping out of a plane. So remember, when a skydiver jumps out of a plane, they'll be in free fall to begin with, but as they accelerate downwards, they gain speed, and therefore the air resistance or drag acting up the way will increase until eventually the vertical forces acting on the skydiver become balanced. At this point, we say they're traveling at a constant speed, which we call a terminal velocity. So when they're moving at a constant speed, that would be Newton's first law at play, whereas when they're accelerating downwards, that would be Newton's second law at play. Moving on to section five, we have projectile motion. Now you need to be able to explain projectile motion in terms of constant vertical acceleration and constant horizontal velocity. So remember these two key phrases are what gives a projectile its curved path. So it's really important to remember those. You also need to be able to use appropriate relationships to solve problems involving projectile motion from a horizontal launch, including the use of motion graphs. So remember we can find the horizontal distance traveled or the range by finding the area under the horizontal velocity against time graph. We can also find the vertical distance traveled or the height by finding the area under the vertical velocity against time graph. For calculations involving horizontal motion, remember we can use the speed distance time equation, or if we're talking about horizontal velocities, i.e. vectors, then we can use VH equals S over T, displacement, horizontal velocity, and time. And for vertical motion, remember we have constant vertical acceleration, so we can use the acceleration equation. This is just the rearranged form of the acceleration equation for vertical motion, where instead of saying A equals V minus U over T, you could write it in terms of the final vertical velocity V. And I've called it VV here and UV just to help you remember that this is vertical motion. So we have final vertical velocity VV is equal to the initial vertical velocity UV plus AT. But if that confuses you, just use A equals V minus U over T. Lastly, for section five, it says to explain satellite orbits in terms of projectile motion, horizontal velocity, and weight. Well, remember we can use Newton's thought experiment to explain why satellites travel in a circular orbit. And this says that the horizontal velocity of the projectile must be large enough so that the projectile falls towards the Earth's surface at the same rate that the Earth curves away from it. And this allows the projectile to travel in a circular path. 
and remember the projectile is going to accelerate towards the surface of the Earth at all times because of its weight, its acceleration due to gravity. Lastly, for section 6 we have energy and it says to explain energy conservation and energy conversion and transfer. Well, this is getting at the idea of the law or principle of conservation of energy, which says that energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can only be changed from one form into another. So you just need to be aware of lots of different types of energy, including the main ones we look at in this section, which are work done, gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy. Next, you need to be able to use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving work done, force and distance or displacement. So the equation we have is EW equals FD, where EW is the work done, F is usually the unbalanced force, or if the forces are balanced and the object is already moving, then we take F to be the thrust force, and D is the distance. Next, you need to be able to define gravitational potential energy. So remember, this is the energy that an object has when it's been raised above the Earth's surface, i.e. the ground, by some height. You also need to use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving gravitational potential energy, mass, gravitational field strength, and height. So the equation is EP equals MGH, where EP is your gravitational potential energy, M is your mass, G is gravitational field strength, and H is height. Next, you need to be able to define kinetic energy, and we say that this is the type of energy that any object that is in motion will have. So a moving object will have a kinetic energy. You then need to be able to use an appropriate relationship to solve problems involving kinetic energy, mass, and speed. So that's this equation here, EK equals a half MV squared, where EK is your kinetic energy, M is your mass, and V is the speed. Lastly, it says to use appropriate relationships to solve problems involving conservation of energy. For example, there might be situations where the gravitational potential energy is completely converted into kinetic energy, assuming no energy loss is due to friction or air resistance. Or there might be a situation where work done can be completely converted into gravitational potential energy. So for example, you could say EP equal to EK when you've got a ball raised above the ground and you drop that ball. That would be gravitational potential energy changing into kinetic energy. And a situation involving work done changing into gravitational potential energy could be someone raising an object from the ground up to a certain height, such as taking books from the ground and putting them on a bookshelf up high. So you could then expand on these expressions and put in the equations. So you could have MGH is equal to a half MV squared for this one. And on the right hand side, you could have FD is equal to MGH. And you could then do a bit of manipulation to try and find an unknown variable. That's all for this video, folks. Thanks for watching. If you made it to the end, I really appreciate it. Make sure to give the video a like, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.